environment variables. You write a program, you deliver it to someone, they're gonna go off and run it again and again. They're not gonna recompile it all the time, they just wanna work with the program as you hand it to them. So there's certain things we want them to be able to play around with that changes the execution environment of that program without having to recompile it. That's where we use environment variables. All right, example. Probably the most obvious one you can think of. OMP num threads. So this is an environment variable that says, by default, how many threads should I use? And I'm gonna tell you something, even though we've been playing around with putting a call to OMP set num threads inside your code, in a production setting, you'd, you'd almost never do that. You almost always leave it to the environment variable. So I have set environment or set however your shell interacts with setting environment variables. If I set OMP underscore nem underscore threads to an integer literal, that's how many threads I'm asking for. Now another environment variable that can be very important is remember when you start up a, a program, and that program's gonna have a collection of threads for a process. For each thread, it's gonna allocate a block of stack. That stack is physical memory. So if you have big variables being created on the stack of each thread, you can run out of stack size. You can overflow the stack size. And the way that works, what happens when you do that is you start trashing memory. So your program crashes really bad. I mean bad. It can take out the whole operating system. I mean, it's just, it's ugly. So there are times when you want to tell the system, when you create the threads, allocate extra stack size. That's where you would use an environment variable, OMP stack size. So you, you set the environment variable and it, you're telling the system, this is how much stack size I want you to set aside when you create the threads. There's another environment variable I want to talk to you about called OMP weight policy. Now remember there are these times when you had like a barrier or a lock a critical section, different times when I said that while the threads are there, they're gonna wait until they get their turn, all right? That's called a wait policy. And there's different policies, and this is starting to get into operating system design and how you, how you um, optimize what you do with threads. Um, so you have a wait policy called active or passive. Active does something called a spin lock. It says, I want that thread to actively spin waiting for something to be available. Now, that burns up resources. If there's a cost, nothing's free, all right? So there's a cost. If a thread is just spinning, waiting for its turn to get a lock or get a critical section released to it, that's burning up CPU cycles spinning. All right, so there's another mode called passive. And what passive says is the thread that's waiting, put it to sleep. Just suspend that thread and park it off to the side. I don't want it eating up CPU cycles. So that's your choice. You can have an OMP weight policy of active or an OMP weight policy of passive. Now, why would you want to use one versus the other? And let me tell you, to suspend a thread and then re-wake it up again is very expensive. It costs you a lot. Whereas if a thread is spin waiting, to take it from waiting to active state costs you almost nothing. It's very, very cheap. So if you believe that your program isn't going to wait long, um, like for example, in the exa when I talked earlier about the histogram example, um, there, my threads were never going to wait long. You know, maybe long enough for one thread to update a histogram bin and then go on. So there, yeah, an active policy would make sense. I don't want the overhead of suspending and re-waking up. So that's where I might want active. But if, um, if it's going to be a really long time, so I have a huge function inside a critical section, now I may want a thread that's waiting to suspend. So this is an optimization between active and passive wait policy. The last environment variable I want to talk about is called OMP proc bind, which stands for processor bind. Remember earlier, I mentioned the fact that even though we describe a lot of CPUs as SMP, the fact of the matter is a lot of them are not symmetric multiprocessors, they're non-uniform memory architectures. That means that there is memory that's closer to a processor than to another processor. And anytime you put a cache hierarchy on a collection of processor cores, you end up with a NUMA machine. So what processor bind says is, I have a program where I do not want you to move threads around. Once you bind a thread to a processor, leave it there. That's what processor bind does. Now, there's a trade-off. 
right? Let's say you turn on processor bind true. It creates threads, it binds them to a core. Now let's say part were through your competition, oh, I don't know, your virus software, antivirus software kicks in. And it's gonna run a big virus scan on one of your cores. Well, normally, if I had processor bind false, it would see that, hey, this core is really, really busy. Maybe I should migrate that thread to a different core that's not as busy. So this is where you get the, ban the benefits of being able to migrate threads around. So uh, be careful when you use it. There is a cost to turning on processor binding. But if I'm writing a tight piece of code where I've done a lot of work to pre-stage data in my caches, eh, then I might want processor binding on. This is something for you to play with as you experiment with OpenMP.